Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty. I come with you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and and bring you the news behind the news, the story behind the story, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Western civilization, it's going to be reality, not illusion or delusion, that will determine uh, what the future will bring. And uh, Well, this next uh, hour is going to be an interesting time. We're going to be talking to Greg Miller. And, and Greg Miller uh, certainly wrote a book, How uh, I Reversed uh, My Mom's Emphysema. How um, I Reversed My Mom's Emphysema. And, and uh, basically, Greg, thanks very much for being with us tonight. Sure. Glad to be here. What is it to give us a little of your background? Now, you're not a doctor. You're not medically trained, are you? No, not at all. In well, fact, why um, don't you just go ahead and tell us uh, how it happened that you you wrote a book about how I uh, reversed my mom's emphysema? My mother was diagnosed in 2003, and uh, my degree is actually in engineering. And I had done some graduate work in pathology and pulmonary physiology and human genetics um, stuff I'd never used, and you know had it under my belt, but it was about 20 years old. But I noticed. Um, she quit smoking, and two and a half years into her illness, I noticed she, you know, she wasn't smoking anymore, but yet she'd lost so much weight. She was down to 77 pounds. She was on four liters of oxygen, you know, the supplemental continuous 24-7 oxygen. Um, she could only eat a tiny bit of food, maybe something, uh, the amount you'd feed maybe a one- or two-year-old, and uh, she could only sleep about an hour at a time. And the doctors didn't seem to be alarmed by this at all. And I mean, I did eventually realize that the reason was she was dying right on schedule. And uh, so I started looking to um, initially alternatives. And what I ended up finding was very well-hidden research that was actually done by physicians and, and PhDs um, that wasn't necessarily done on emphysema, but done on uh, other pathogens. And I then, you know, applied it to, to emphysema. I was in a kind of a desperate situation. I knew she was going to die in a few months if I didn't do something. So, so I kind of went the unconventional route. So, well, because emphysema is, is a condition where the lungs tend to lose their elasticity. They would it ordinarily attributed to chronic smoking, and of course, the it, 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 whole uh, a system of. Uh, uh, Air passages uh, simply are not functioning. Uh, the uh, tissues lose their elasticity, and uh, certainly people feel that they've got this pressure on the chest. They can't uh, expand their lungs. They can't get the air in. Uh, they get under with certainly oxygen, and it's a miserable way to die. You see these people, they huff and they puff, and uh, of course they get to ex- try, constantly trying to expand their, their pulmonary cage. So what did you find as you began looking into the background of emphysema? What was the information that was not being made public? Well, the first thing that I realized, she was on oxygen, and she began getting migraine headaches. And uh, I took her to her, her uh, primary care physician. He prescribed antibiotics, which did nothing. Um, I then tried on my own um, Tylenol. Uh, one time I tried Advil. That didn't do anything. I tried aspirin. That didn't do anything. I finally began researching, and it, it, I asked her where her head was hurting, and she pointed to areas that appeared to be sinuses. So I started looking up, you know, sinus headaches, and found that that was um, uh, recalled, you know, sinusitis often, oftentimes. So I started looking up sinusitis, and I found Dr. Hirohito Kita at Mayo Clinic had published research in 1999 saying that 96% of sinusitis was caused by a fungal infection. Hold that I thought. Think. Hold that thought. We'll okay. be back in just a moment here.
All right, Greg, well, you were just saying that, of course, you found out that certainly a very responsible physician had pointed out that uh, the vast majority of, uh, of, uh, of headaches, uh, of sinusitis type of headaches, uh, was coming from a fungal infection. So well, what do you do for a fungal infection? Well, I then got a hold of a clinical mycology textbook and uh, began researching that and, and started looking at alternative websites and found um, a suggestion that um, olive leaf extract would take away the fungus. I didn't really personally think it would work, but I pretty much exhausted every other option. So I went to the health food store and bought olive leaf extract nasal spray and brought it home. And these headaches had been lasting all day long. My mom squirted two squirts in each nostril, and about 15 minutes later, she came walking out of her bedroom and said the headache's gone. So I was pretty amazed that that something that easy would take it away and even more surprised that her doctor was prescribing antibiotics and had never heard of Dr. Keita or his research. Well, I think you have to understand how medicine works, Greg, because you go to your meetings and because you get these experts up there and they talk. And and now, because I've been around for 50 years, I graduated from medical school. Well, we're going to have our 60th uh, anniversary of graduation from medical school uh, in in, in next April. But I go to these medical meetings and they're saying the same things today that they said uh, 50 years ago in medicine. And this is the way that it's done. You're not supposed to challenge it. You're just supposed to go along with it. And, of course, these drug companies are not necessarily interested in getting anybody cured. After you get cured, why, of course, they're not going to use your medication. And that with our people working within organized medicine who have a different world vision of what the world should be. And, unfortunately, the doctor is trapped in a system that he has no control over. So anyway, because I think it's fascinating, the, you were able then to improve your mother's headaches uh, by simply using this olive leaf extract, which is a, a very, very old technique, and yet it would work. A lot of these things worked for many, many years before we had all the modern-day antibiotics. Go right ahead with your story. Well, I, I actually did find that also in Leviticus in the Bible, that um, way back, you know, 3,000 years ago, if someone got a moldy stone in their house, the rabbi would come in and wrap it in olive leaves and go bury it. So apparently it had been around a long time. Um, that was just the first little thing that I realized the doctors... Hold that have thought. To... Hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan. Greg was sort of desperate. His mother was dying. It was obvious that the, she was not going to last much longer. She was down 75, 78 pounds, and, and she now has terrible headaches, and the uh, doctor gives her antibiotics, and, and she doesn't get any better. Greg comes to the conclusion it's sinusitis because that's where her pain is, and then, of course, uh, he looks it up. He finds out that a oh, sort of a qualified doctor at a major university is simply said that the uh, that uh, most headaches are related of course uh, to um, the, a fungal infection uh, Greg looks up finds out the fungal infection will respond to uh, olive oil ex- ex- extract olive leaf extract uh, gets it from the health food store a couple of squirts of that and 15 minutes later his mother's headaches are gone did they come back again uh, they did recur um, I also found out that the antibiotics actually ensured the chronicity of fungal infections and you know she'd been getting repeated doses of that so but eventually they did uh, you know become less frequent and eventually subsided but I also found um, I started looking elsewhere then I realized the doctor didn't have enough time to do all the research I found research at University of Nevada School of Medicine uh, directed by Dr. Hunter and it was cancer research And they were taking all the sugar out of the people's diet, claiming that cancer cells had 90-plus receptor sites on each cell, and the first thing they were doing was beginning to starve the cancer. And I thought, it seems like something is growing in her lungs, whatever pathogen that is. Maybe it eats sugar, too. Maybe taking the sugar out of her diet will help. Like I was saying, you know, I was was pretty desperate at this point. So I did that, and uh, two weeks later, she had actually improved the, the... improvements were small and very subtle, but 
but they were nonetheless there. See? And I think it's important that people understand that sugar, now I like sugar, but basically it lowers your immune response and it makes you more susceptible to both infections and to cancer. And you have to understand that. So you should really limit your sugar intake because, of course, if you do that, it will really help your body to have the ability to deal with infection and, of course, to deal with cancer. Go right ahead. Another thing Dr. Hunter was doing in the research out at University of Nevada School of Medicine for cancer was he was giving the patients a micronized beta-glucan, beta-1316 glucan, and that was amplifying their immune response. Along with that, he gave them proteolytic enzymes, which tore away the protective protein covering on the cancer cell. So I got both of those from my mother and gave them to her, and there again, we had some more incremental changes that were improvements in her health and her breathing. <clears throat> Excuse me. By that point, it, we had gone for about a month and a half, and she was actually down to three liters of oxygen instead of being on four and gasping for air. I didn't realize it at the time, but she had gained six pounds. She was eating more food. She was sleeping, you know, two or three hours at a stretch instead of one hour. So she was improving, you know, but but very small improvements over time. So I kept researching, and uh, I found in acetyl L-cysteine, I found out that mucus was had lots of sulfur, and the sulfur atoms formed disulfide bonds, and this NAC would break the disulfide bonds, and about 600 milligrams of it would liquefy the mucus, so she could cough it up and spit it out. Otherwise, I would hear her coughing and hear it rustling around in her lungs, but she could never cough it up. So, And she would always take mucinex, which just dried it up in her lungs and left that residual in there, and I think that was the reason for all the secondary infections that caused her to need um, more prescriptions for antibiotics. So the NAC made another improvement, allowed her to breathe a little better. The exacerbations almost went away. She was you know, waking up every hour before I started the diet even, you know, a few months earlier, about every hour she would wake up. So I was making a pot of coffee at night, staying up all night so I could check on her every 10 or 15 minutes, you know, until she woke up the next morning. So um, I also found omega-3 fatty acids um, lowered inflammation, and uh, I was mega-dosing that, giving her six to 8,000 IUs of omega-3, along with the proteolytic enzymes and the beta-glucan, and that eliminated the need for prednisone. I had watched her really, be, uh, really, uh, the, watched the, the disease really, really progress. It seemed like it was accelerating during a 12-month period where she had three or four uh, prescriptions for prednisone and seven for antibiotics. During that 12 months, she really, really went downhill and it, it was put in her medical record in stage emphysema at the end of that year. So I knew we were at a very critical time that we had to do something or she was going to die. I didn't really think any of this stuff was going to work. I thought she was going to die, but I thought, you know, I've got to try something, you know. So, so, and I was very amazed that everything started, started working. I mean, it, it, I ended up doing about 6,500 hours of research over the three and a half years. A lot of it was wasted on pharmaceutical websites that just talked about how their drugs would slow the progress of the disease, which, you know, I don't know if it actually does that or not. I know that it, does, it definitely doesn't cure the disease, and it definitely doesn't stop its progress. The diet alone seems to stop its progress and begin killing it off a little bit, whatever this pathogen was that was in her lungs. So... You know, before I even gave her any of the supplements or found any of them, she seemed to be improving. And uh, so I just kept researching. I realized the doctors didn't have all the answers at that point. You know, her the, her um, GP that she was going to and her pulmonary specialist, at one point, the first visit back to the pulmonary specialist, after um, I had started doing this stuff, he was, her pulmonary specialist, a real nice guy. He's very laid back, very quiet. And he left her in the treatment room and came out to the waiting room where there were other patients sitting. 
and very animated said, what have you been doing? She's getting better. Because I realized now that he didn't have any other patients that were getting well. No one else was getting better. They were all slowly deteriorating with these medications. Well, cortisone, you know, really is a terrible, terrible medication. Yes, it's certainly the cases where it can be dramatic, but if you get somebody onto cortisone on a regular basis, it upsets their whole, uh, the whole of uh, certainly endocrine balance, and uh, it, it uh, actually thins their bones. It predisposes them to uh, uh, bleeding ulcers. Oh. But really, I mean, I used a tremendous amount of cortisone. It is a miraculous drug under certain circumstances, but its chronic use is really disabling. It really will stop people when they're having certain acute allergic reactions. But when used on a regular basis, I think it's disastrous. And certainly I look back on many times we use these medications because this is what we're trained to do. But if we can come up with other things, and of course you were using large doses of the omega-3 fats to do pretty much the same thing, weren't you? Yes. Okay, yeah, and go right ahead. That, well, that kind of took the place of the prednisone, which I was trying to do. Um, I then also found Dr. Fred Pescatori. He's an MD in New York City that had written a book called The Allergy and Asthma Cure, and he has an eight-step cure for allergies and asthma, which kind of threw me. I didn't really believe it initially because I thought, well, why are all these doctors prescribing asthma and allergy medication if there's a cure for that? So I got a copy of his book and read it, and in his eight steps, he also said one of the critical elements is to restore the immune system and the intestinal flora with the probiotics that have been killed by the antibiotics. So that was my first, that my introduction to probiotics. So I started reading all about them and ended up finding some enteric-coated probiotics that also had the prebiotic formula, which is their food supply. Can you, why don't you, just for our listeners out there, a lot of them may not understand what probiotics are. But, and uh, they, they think of antibiotics, because they're not, they're bacteria, and they are to replenish the bacteria in our guts. I've said to you, one of the most powerful healing uh, mechanisms within our body is our own body, and the, uh, actually it is the bacteria with our own intestine, which of course will be disrupted with the use certainly of antibiotics and with the use of prednisone. And so basically we we kill off the bacteria, which is such an important part of the health product of our own body. But explain why this works as far as you're concerned, Greg. Well, I, you know, the, the reason that Dr. Pescatori, uh, you know, his reasons were that, um, that it made up, um, I think he said, a fifth of your immune system, that it, was, it promoted the production of red blood cells and white blood cells, which is a large portion of our immune system. It, it produces vitamin B12, and in, in very simplistic terms, it's kind of like the gatekeeper. It's kind of like somebody breaks in your house and steals your TV, and before they get out the door, you shoot them, and then you leave the door unlocked for the next night. You know, there's no sense in killing the bad bacteria and then leaving the gate wide open so that there's, so that more pathogens can get in. So he's saying replace these probiotics and restore your immune system, especially if you're fighting you know, an illness, a serious illness, you've but got to have... he's saying uh, replace your intestinal bacteria is what he's saying. Go ahead. Yes, yes, exactly, the probiotics. And then he went further and said, you know, the lactobacillus strains will replace the lost probiotics in your small intestine and the bifida strains would replace those in the large intestine. So when I purchased the probiotics, I made sure... It was enteric-coated, had the prebiotic formula, and had the lactobacillus and the bifidus strains in it. And uh, that made further improvements in my mother's health. And it, it, it's strange, but it's, you know, it's, they're slow improvements. It's not like taking a, you know, I noticed when she would use one of the drugs that were prescribed, in an hour she was very much improved. And then when the drug would wear off, she was right back where she started before taking it. So it didn't really... Well, uh, certainly our guest is Greg Miller. His book is How I Reversed My Mother's Emphysema. We'll be back in just a moment. 
right here at Radio Liberty. Greg, go right ahead. Um, well, that that was the the information I had gotten from Dr. Pescatori in his book. So I continued looking. I found another book by Dr. Baruti who said that um, all disease was a result of acid residue. I wasn't sure I believed that, but he went further and said our Western diet is a big cause of us being very acidic and that that acid is actually causing a lot of the illnesses that we have. So he said, you know, you need to push yourself over to the alkaline side a little bit. So I started checking and uh, found alfalfa was a very inexpensive, you know, alfalfa tablets were very inexpensive, and they had uh, vitamin A, B, C, D, E, and K, and had all of the essential amino acids, and also had chlorophyll that would cleanse the liver and the kidneys and, and uh, the large and small intestines. So I started giving my mother alfalfa. They were hard for her to swallow, so I would dissolve them in water and pour some V8 juice in, which she liked, and give her that three times a day. So she would have her two alfalfa tablets. Um, so that helped a little more. I also got um, a potassium bicarbonate capsules and gave those to her. Dr. Baruti was saying that the first way your body neutralizes the acid is with bicarbonate. When it runs out of its bicarbonate reserves, it then goes to your bones and starts robbing your bones of magnesium, calcium, and phosphorus because he said it will neutralize the acid one way or another. So, And he said this is the reason that, you know, in our society, in the Western society, we have so many elderly people with osteoporosis and you go to these third world countries, they don't have that. They're not eating this acidic diet that we eat. So I thought, well, that's very interesting. So I made sure she had her alfalfa every day. So with each one of these guys that I found, she was also on a statin drug to lower her cholesterol. And that and found, is the worst thing in the world you can do, as you, as you well, I'm sure, have found out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I found a book by uh, Ufi Ravznikov. He's an MD, PhD. His book is called The Cholesterol Myth, and the subtitle is The Fallacy That Cholesterol or High Cholesterol Causes Heart Disease or something like that. And he shows how they actually arrived at that from statistical data, saying, you know, this population uh, eats this many cows with this much fat, and they have this many heart attacks. And he said they actually threw out three or four of the countries because the people had very high cholesterol and very low heart disease, and others, a few others, had very low cholesterol but very high heart disease. So they threw those out of the study so that they could show what they were wanting to show, which was high cholesterol equals heart disease. So at that point, that was the only drug I actually took her off of because I also found that the statin drug blocked coenzyme Q10 production, which was necessary to keep her heart healthy, and the second leading cause of death for emphysema patients was heart failure. And I thought, they're setting her up for heart failure by doing this. So I, I personally took her off of that. I probably should not have done that. I wouldn't recommend somebody else take themselves off their medications. But I did that for my mother. But uh, Well, you know, I will uh, tell you that I have taken, well, each person has to decide. But as a physician, I will tell you that when my uh, good friend of mine put me on to a, a, a antihypertensive medication because I wanted to get my blood pressure down, and we'll be back in a minute. I'll tell you this story. Well, this is Dr. Stad. I guess it's Greg Miller. We're talking about his book, How I Reversed My Mom's Emphysema. How I Reversed My Mother's... Uh, is it mother's or mom's? Mom's. Mom's emphysema. I probably should have said mother. That would have been more proper, but... Well, basically, I, 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 of course, uh, uh, Greg is just taking us through the steps. And first, one of the things he did, why he read a book on statin drugs. And, of course, he took his mother off of the emphysema, and uh, off of the statin drugs. And you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, statin drugs are, are poison. They work by poisoning your liver. 
Uh, they are really very, very good. They're very, very good for uh, the company that produces them. I, I, they made, uh, made billions and billions and billions of dollars by doctoring the reports, uh, by uh, trying to convince you that the statistical evidence, of course, you're going to get uh, you know, fewer heart attacks and fewer strokes. And they, you see this figure used 30%, 30%, isn't that great? What they're really telling you, of course, is that if you took 100 patients and you put them uh, on a placebo, why maybe 3% would uh, develop a heart attack or a stroke. If you took that, say, another 100 patients and put them on, uh, say, the, um, uh, the uh, Lipitor or the other statin drugs, uh, why, of course, only two of them would come up with a heart attack or stroke. So, therefore, there's a 30% difference. No, ladies and gentlemen, that's a 1% difference. Figures don't lie, liars figure. They do this all the time, and if there's any, in fact, and most people, if you've never had a previous heart attack or stroke, you will get absolutely no benefit at all uh, from taking the Lipitor uh, or the other statin drugs. Uh, they're carcinogenic, they affect your mind, uh, they predispose you to cancer, uh, it will not uh, make you healthier. And this is one of the greatest lies ever told, and yet the doctors, most of them actually accept that 30%, without ever looking at the medical records, which shows a 1% difference, and that certainly is certainly well within the range of, of uh, accident. But this is very, very profitable, and the FDA has gone along with the scam, and certainly the drug companies have gone along with it. We're talking about uh, something 20 or $30 billion a year profit from statin drugs that uh, lower the CoQ10 and predispose you to getting progressive heart, heart failure. Well, anyway, of course, Greg uh, takes his mother off of the statin drugs. He says he probably shouldn't have. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to start looking after your own health. And I was just telling one do doctor friend of mine, cardiologist, uh, he found out that my blood pressure was elevated. I think it was 160 over, oh, maybe uh, um, uh, 90, 160 um, over 90. It's been that way for, for 50 years. And he insisted that I take these antihypertensive drugs, give me the free samples. I've read the statistics, and so there was about a 1% difference between whether you took the drug and whether you didn't take the drug. Eventually, I had my atrial uh, valve replaced. And what I did, why, of course, my blood pressure returned to normal. Uh, this was after, you know, I'd had an elevated blood pressure for over 50 years. And, of course, it was because my heart had to pump harder because I didn't have any room for my blood to get through my atrial valve. If I'd taken the the, antihyp the antihypertensive drug, I would probably went out a stroke and died. This man is a friend of mine. He's an honest man, and I'm sure he never read the package brochure. Read the package brochures yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the statistics. Remember, figures don't lie. Liars figure an awful lot of them work for the drug companies, and they work for the FDA, and they're all in the scam together. And I hate to sound like somebody is criticizing medicine, and yet I must because I think they're absolutely wrong. I think that you have to be responsible for your own health. And this is what happened to Greg. He began taking on the responsibility for his mother's health, and she started getting better, and she was going to die. And uh, the emphysema, people with emphysema do die at a relatively young age. And, of course, I'm sure that most of what he's saying is absolutely true. Our telephone number is one triple eight two four liberty one triple eight two four liberty or four six four eight two nine five. If you have a question or comment for Greg, uh, he says that he lived this. But go ahead, Greg. Tell us then what you did next. Again, our oh, number is one triple eight two four liberty four six four eight two nine five. Go ahead. One of the things that I do recommend people do that's in the book is get a copy of your medical record because I got a copy of the medical record. And I also then started asking for a complete list of medications she was being prescribed and then started looking them up on the Internet. And I would type in the drug name and then type in CON, C-O-N, so I could find out negative things about these drugs. And then I also typed in FORUM after the drug name. 
and found many, many, many forums that uh, hold that thought. People hold that thought. Well, this is Dr. Stan back here. Our guest this evening is Greg Miller. Our telephone number, if you have a question or comment, is one triple eight two four liberty. One triple eight two four liberty or four six four eight two nine five. And and Greg has written the book How I Reversed My Mom's Emphysema. How I Reversed My Mom's Emphysema. Uh, Greg, how can people get copies of your book? Um, I have a website that. Um www.emphysema-treatment.com and I do have the menu there I have a number of the supplements and I have the logic what I think is the logic behind what's causing this disease this pathogen that seems to be proliferating that the doctors and the pharmaceutical industry doesn't seem to be addressing or acknowledging, and so as a result, they're not treating it. You know? Well, now, what is the pathogen do you think that is primarily responsible for this? I suspect it's a fungus, but I've had so many people want to debate that with me. I started calling it an unknown pathogen. All these pathogens, apparently, that invade the body do have sugar as their food supply. Um, you know, Dr. Hunter was showing that cancer has sugar as its food supply, and I thought, whatever this pathogen is, it might be a fungus, it might not be, but if you take its food supply away, it's going to hurt it. It's going to start 
you know, dying off or at least it's not going to be proliferating anymore. So it's not going to be progressing along. So. All right, fine. Well, now, basically, then you certainly got your mom off the statin drugs. What did you do next? Um, that, I pretty much just held my own with, with all of those things that I had done. And, you know, right at the very beginning, I had got a copy of her medical record, and that's why I recommend that right away in, in the book, is get a copy of your medical record, check out the drugs. I found that the, her primary care physician had her on two heart medication. So I immediately called them and said, why is she on two? And they said, well, she was supposed to not be taking this one. She's supposed to be taking this other one. Yet they were still being filled at the same pharmacy. So you really have to watch it, watch, you know, what they're doing to you because they really aren't watching it for you, you know, and, and I always kind of thought they were. So, um, but I just continued with the diet, continued giving her these supplements, and uh, continued keeping sugar out of her diet, and she she progressed. And it, it since I was doing the research as I was doing this, um, it took about 17 months. But 17 months later, my mother had regained all of her weight. She did not need any supplemental oxygen. She still carried her portable when we would go somewhere. She would carry it with her. She just never did have to turn it on. Um, she was able to eat a full plate of food, in fact, I was working out at the gym at the time. I would take her down to this breakfast buffet, and she would eat, this little tiny 103-pound woman would eat two big full plates of food and then go back for fruit and melon. And a year and a half earlier, she was eating about what you would feed a one- or two-year-old, a little tiny, tiny bit on the plate. And I would try to get her to eat more, and she would say, if I eat more, I can't breathe. So I started suspecting this pathogen proliferates, um, your body adapts and distends your lung. The pathogen grows into those areas. Your body distends your lungs further, and that goes back and forth until eventually your distending lungs, the, the adaptation that your body has for this growing pathogen, eventually crowds your stomach. And so the patient's meals get smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually they can't take in enough food to supply the energy for regular body function plus labored breathing. And we've all seen them sitting in the wheelchair with their oxygen on looking like skin and bone. Well, now, basically, basically, does your mother still have a lot of wheezing? Does she have a lot of a, a, a difficulty? Can she get out and walk without getting short of breath? Yeah, she, in fact, she loved going to garage sales. So, um, you know, 17 months after I started her on the diet, she was able to go to garage sales and, and she actually had not driven a car in six years. Her original complaint when she went to the doctor was that she was dizzy. So he started trying all kinds of different medications and never could find anything that would work for her. In the meantime, he discovers COPD or emphysema. He discovers her high cholesterol. You know, he figures out that she's probably got osteoporosis. So she comes back with, you know, a, a list of four, five, six drugs. And... uh you know, she was just getting worse by the by the month now, on all these what medications. Me what medications is she on at the present time? What sort of heart medicine? Um, she isn't on any, actually, anymore. She got very, very negative toward the, the medical industry altogether. And, you know, not, I mean, not, not the doctors themselves, but the pharmaceutical industry, really. She stopped taking everything. She pretty much wasn't taking, she, you know, we'd got her off the Fosamax with alfalfa and potassium bicarbonate. Um, I had taken her off the Crestor. Um, the other drugs were the COPD and emphysema medications, and I didn't actually have to take her off any of those, and I wouldn't have anyway, but they, when she was in end-stage emphysema, they one by one stopped working. The albuterol sulfate first stopped working, so they switched her to Duoneb, which includes the hypertropium bromide, the same thing that's in Combavent, the rescue inhaler. And that worked for a short time, and pretty soon Spireva quit working, so she wouldn't use it. Then Advir quit working, she wouldn't use it. And just one by one, they all just stopped providing the temporary relief that they once had provided. So, so she basically took herself off of them. She was a small lady, you know, at the time, but, I mean, she... 
her her regular body weight was 103. So when she got down to 77 pounds, it wasn't like a 150 pound woman getting down to 77 pounds. She had only been 103 to start with, but it was still a fourth of her body weight that she had lost. So, and since then, um, when I, I didn't really intend on writing a book, I wanted to get to get her well and get back to work. I gave the information to a friend of mine who had been a tech for me. Um, I was uh, marketing software and was a regional manager. He was my tech. He had asthma really bad and allergies. I said, Dan, try this stuff, see if it helps you any. He tried it, and a couple weeks later called me and said, it's amazing. I laid down last night for the first time that I ever remember when I wasn't wheezing. And so he stayed on the diet and started taking the supplements that I'd given to my mother. And I actually spoke with him about four days ago, and he said, I got off Singular. That was the medication he was taking currently. But he had taken some form of asthma medication since he was a little boy. And he said, I got off of that and started taking the beta-glucan that you recommended. And that worked. And he said, I took it for about six or seven months. And he said, now I'm not taking it even. You know, he said, I don't need any medications at all. And he'd been on medication, asthma medication, since he was about, I think, six or seven years old or maybe eight. Well, now, basically, how many copies of the book have you sold? uh, And what sort of response have people gotten from following this protocol you've laid out? Um, I've only sold a couple thousand of the books. We're a little bit below 2,000 even. It's been in eight different countries. Um, I think people are in disbelief. I mean, if my doctor told me you have a disease that's terminal and some other person said, you know, somebody else that didn't go to medical school claims they have a, a cure for it, I would be really looking closely at what they're saying before I believed them, you know. So I think that's part of the problem. Um, however, I've had, uh, you know, in eight different countries the book has been selling. I have one guy even that's a hospital administrator that um, he won't put it in writing because he's worried about his job, but he called me and said, I have access to some of the best pulmonary specialists in the world, and they couldn't help me. All they had were the medications that didn't help me. And he said, the day I bought your book, I couldn't get to the mailbox and back without sitting in a chair and gasping for air. He said, I've been following what you did for your mom for 13 days, and I can already make the trip 10 times without any distress. So that was real nice to hear. And I get emails daily. I got one yesterday from a guy who has had the book about six weeks, and he's sticking to the diet very strictly and taking the supplements. And uh, I, I actually didn't get it from him. I got it from his son. And his son was saying, "I can. we can already tell a big difference in his ability to breathe, and he's getting real excited because he had kind of accepted the fact that he was going to die from this disease, and now he has a, a whole new outlook because he now believes that he is going to survive it because he's getting better almost daily from what the, from what his son was saying. Well, so, now, what about the olive leaf extract? Do you use that uh, uh, routinely, or is that just for the sinus headaches? That was just for the sinus headaches. Um, it's a good antifungal. So when I was suspecting that it was a fungal infection, I started cycling these antifungals, and I found when I, I grabbed a clinical mycology textbook and found out that there's pathogenic fungi that are easier to get rid of, but then there's the other side, which are the opportunistic fungi, which actually get in and emulate human cells, so they go undetected by your immune system, and they also adapt to these antifungals. So I would cycle them. I gave her caprylic acid for a month. That was one. I gave her apple cider vinegar for a month. Um, and I kept cycling them, olive leaf extract. And eventually, I got the doctor. I found a, an osteopath that would prescribe. When I, I actually wrote all this stuff down and took it in and, and actually printed out a file called What I Have Observed. And this is what I had, had observed over two and a half to three years in her decline and then her recovery or her almost complete recovery got him convinced to give her Nystatin, which is a statin drug, but just for a month um, that was supposed to be a good antifungal. And then after that, um, fluconazole, which is the generic for diflucan. And that one's real, 
real scary because it, it has a tendency to elevate liver enzymes, so they're very reluctant to prescribe it. So I told them I would take her to the hospital lab and get her blood tested every week if they would provide it for her. So they did, and she actually had six or, I guess, six weeks worth of uh, fluconazole, and uh, she got a hold of the bottle. I had it up on top of the refrigerator, and how she got that off of there, I really don't know because she can't reach up there, but she managed to get a hold of them and took them um, six days in a row, and it was supposed to be one a week. So she took six weeks of this fluconazole in one week, and I got up one morning, and she was standing up, had the oxygen turned off. She had taken her own shower. She had cleaned out one of her closets. And I felt like I'd woke up in the twilight zone. She had improved so incredibly in those seven days. Um, now, what, what, days after what, 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 again, is this uh, product that you're describing? It, it's actually a medication. What is Yeah. But, you know, it's just, it's not something that you take daily to manage a disease. It's something that you take to, to kill a systemic fungus. So that's why I started suspecting that it was a fungal infection because these antifungals seem to really work well. I think a lot of them, though, are also antibacterial, antiviral. And so that's when I started saying, well, we'll call it an unknown pathogen because these things all seem to work for any pathogen, you know, the diet. And uh, most of these all natural supplements I was giving her. Well, you know, uh, Greg, many of the great uh, uh, advances in medicine have been made just by mistakes. You know, so they, uh, they, uh, we've, they found out about penicillin because they had noticed that when they were trying to grow bacteria, they got the penicillin uh, fungus there on the uh, on the plates where you're growing the bacteria. You couldn't grow the bacteria, and they were trying to figure out they could stop that. You know, you know, from killing the bacteria they were trying to grow until somebody said, hey, if penicillin kills bacteria, maybe we ought to start using that to kill bacteria. That's how this all came about. Many of the great advances in medicine uh, have come about exactly like that. Well, we've got a caller from Soquel, California. Again, our number is one triple eight two four liberty or four six four eight two nine five. Barbara, are you there? Yes, I am. Do you have a question or comment? I mostly a comment. I just want to commend uh, Greg for what he has done, because by reading and uh, and. Uh, studying and doing all of the things that he has done, he has actually learned some of the things that one of them actually that when his mother was taking the antibiotics was the fact that she should take a probiotic uh, because she he learned one of the things that I learned from one of probably one of the finest doctors of infectious disease that I ever knew and uh, and most doctors did not understand this process at all. And that was the fact that you had to, to re- restore that, you know, um, in, in the, the intestinal... Yeah, the intestinal flora after you... Yes, absolutely. It's, it is so important. In and fact, I, I bet that was Dr. Petrelli, who, of course, was a, a mutual friend of ours, and Dr. Petrelli was an infectious disease specialist. We used to call him Bugs, but uh, he really was a brilliant individual, helped me with uh, literally hundreds of difficult cases during the time we practiced together, and he is sorely missed. But yeah, uh, certainly, uh, the, this is one of the things he kept stressing, and the other doctors didn't really understand. You've got the infection, you give them antibiotics, you get them better. But, of course, you've actually uh, destroyed their intestinal flora. And, of course, bugs used to always insist on the probiotic. Go right ahead, Barbara. No, he was. He was an, an absolutely you know, brilliant man and, and doctor, and uh, he is sorely missed. But also, Greg, you know, thank you for when you said when you look get the uh, prescriptions, read the side effects. When the doctor will tell you, oh, there are no side effects, when you get that drug medicine from the pharmacist, read the side effects because they are there 
and some of these doctors do not even understand it. So you have done a great job, and um, well, thank you. I, I'm, you know, I, you know, just the fact that you have done so much for your mother by your studying and understanding and um, the the value of uh, homeopathic medicine you know, the, the natural medicines that we have available for us that can help us so much more than so many of the doctors can uh, prescribe for patients. It, it is truly amazing. And I, I just want to say, yeah, I just want to commend you and say thank you so much. You have, you sure. have done a great job. I appreciate, I appreciate you saying so. God you bless know, her- her doctor had, I had asked her doctor, why is her emphysema getting worse? She quit smoking two and a half years ago, and I've made sure she took all these drugs you prescribed. And he said, uh, he said, well, the truth is we don't know why emphysema gets worse, you know, after smoking cessation. It's a mystery. And so I decided right then that I was going to research this until I either solved the big mystery or she took her last breath, you know. So well, God, what I'm, got me started, so. I'm so glad that you did. Anyway, thank you so much. And more mothers help. need sons like you. <laughs> bye bye. Okay, Greg, we've got three minutes for you to wrap up the program. Go right ahead. Well, I would say, um, you know, if you have the, you know, COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, to uh, certainly not throw in the towel. Go in and. Uh, you know, start at the very beginning, type in all these medications they have you on and and start researching them, not just from the pharmaceutical industry, but in forums where people will tell you what has happened to them after taking them for a long period of time. And uh, maybe visit my website and read the logic page and see if it makes more sense to you. See if it doesn't seem like there is something proliferating in your lungs and, you know, your your lungs then start distending and eventually crowd your stomach and your meals start shrinking and your weight goes down with them. Um, that's I started putting that logic together first and that's when I started knowing what do I need to look for next. Um, so, you know, so far there's been over two th- or a little less than 2,000 people that have purchased the book and, and uh, you know, reported getting better and some are in the process, and some are already well. But well, no, Greg, is the book available on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles? No, I had it on Amazon, and uh, the problem with Amazon was I was actually selling more off my website, and I, I'm a very small one-man company. And what Amazon wanted me to do was pay to print the book up, pay to ship it, and they're a big billion-dollar corporation. They were hanging on to the money for two weeks. So I was having to reach into my own pocket to pay the shipping, and you know, some some weeks I had, you know, about five dollars to get through the week on food. So I actually took it off of Amazon on purpose because of that. Although somebody did email me the other day and say they had bought a used copy on Amazon, so apparently people have read it and uh, gotten better and and are now selling the book. So, but. Um, I may I may go back and put it back on there now that I have more of them selling, but this was early on when I was selling, you know, five books a week, and you know it was a little bit difficult because I was very low on money after taking care of my mother for four and a half years and not selling any software like I had been used to. So, <laughs> so. Well, I'm just glad that you uh, have done this. I want to congratulate you. We may very well consider carrying the book here through Radio Liberty if we can, if, uh, because I think you've got an important message. And most, the most important thing is read the enclosure on those medicines. If you if you read uh, read it, remember the doctor has. And I will admit, when I was a doctor, I never read the uh, the uh, Pax enclosure, but I should have. Well, this is Dr. Stan. We do hope you enjoyed our interview with Greg Miller. Greg, any thoughts before we let you go? Uh, not really. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hoping more people will come and, and visit the website. And, and, and one uh, more time, let's get the website out. It's uh, www.emphysema-treatment, 
dot com. Uh, Lots I, of free I, information. Well, I think probably we will uh, we will carry it because I think that what you described is certainly well worthwhile. Anyway, God bless. We'll be talking to you later. Thanks so very much. You bet. Bye bye. Okay, fine. Well, this is Doctor Stan here, and I think that uh, it's, it's a fascinating program. I hope you've enjoyed it, and certainly uh, there is so much here to medicine. Certainly, we carry uh, some other books, uh, very important books on medicine, health and nutrition secrets, and save your life. But as far as the treatment of, of emphysema, uh, what Greg has come up with is sounds very logical. And I really believe, of course, there are things that we really don't understand about emphysema. And he's probably right. There is some sort of a chronic infection there that keeps the lungs from healing themselves. And certainly uh, uh, what we need to do is, again, looking at alternative treatments. And and sometimes uh, you have to take responsibility for your own health. Well, let me suggest the book, Health and Nutrition Secrets That Can Save Your Life by our good friend Russell Blaylock, his book, Excitotoxins That Taste That Kills, and Natural Strategies for Cancer Patients, three books by our good friend, Dr. Russell Blaylock. We have a four-tape set called Life-Saving Secrets, uh, or, uh, either four tapes or four CDs by interviews with Dr. Russell Blaylock, and we have so much information on our website dealing with health and things that you need to know about cancer, cancer treatments, things you're not going to get through regular channels, the dangers of vaccinations, the dangers of mercury, the dangers of aluminum, uh, the dangers of statin drugs. We've got a four-tape set on statin drugs. These should have been outlawed long ago. Uh, so we have a, a great book on magnesium. We've got a four-tape set on magnesium. You should be taking a magnesium supplement. Most people are low on magnesium. I take it regularly, as does my wife. It really helps with cardiac irregularities and many other things. Please, of course, go to our website and look at the various items we have. And remember our telephone numbers, one 800 Five four four eight nine two seven. If you don't have a uh, have a computer, we'll be glad to send you a free catalog. But find out what is out there, and then of course be prepared. To look after your own health. I will tell you that the whole healthcare delivery system is breaking down, and you're going to have to start being responsible for looking after yourself because of course the price is going to continue going up. The quality of care is going to fall until we get government out of medicine and get the doctors responsible for looking after their patients and doctors who do not uh, simply do what the FDA tells them to do, but will do what's best for their patients. Again, I certainly have a telephone number. If you'd like to reach us, is one triple eight two four liberty one triple eight two four liberty or four six four eight two nine five. Our webpage is radioliberty dot com. That's radioliberty dot com. Certainly, if you'd like to understand that there is a conscious effort to kill off large numbers of people in America, organized, orchestrated, intentional, and this is a new place and as you understand that, that in our four tape set on statin drugs. Uh, you need to get, of course, my treatise on the population control agenda. It's available on our website, on the Internet. Population control agenda, you need to get our talk on planned population production. It's a DVD. And another DVD called None Dare Call It Genocide. None Dare Call It Genocide. And then, of course, we ask you to go to our website, radioliberty.com. We ask you, of course, to... Uh, to tell others about our programs. We ask you to pray for America. We ask you to pray for revival. We ask you to pray for our leaders and ministers, but please pray for Radio Liberty, our provision and our protection.